Hey folks, and welcome back to the Crypto Continental Podcast. So this episode that you're about to hear is a short one, but there's a lot contained inside it. There's a conversation between myself, Strathcole, and Vin. Uh, they're both developers working on the blockchain behind the scenes. And the main point of the conversation is going over Astroport, the dilemmas, the ethics, and the problems ahead with that. Uh, we also go over the paid per job, the further dilemmas, issues, and where everything currently stands with that situation. Uh, if you like these podcasts, like, subscribe, comment. If you want to see um, anybody on these podcasts, let us know in the comment section. We'll strive to reach out and get them on for an episode. Uh, but other than that, folks, enjoy the conversation. Realistically, there's issues with the whole Astroport situation, isn't there, Strafe? And the, the idea at the moment is, is to get everybody sort of updated as to where this is, where it's heading and where it currently stands. But lay it on us, lay, just get us up to date where it is right now. We can go over the issues, the dilemmas, the ethics and everything after. Hey, um, yeah, well, I can tell you my personal take on it and uh, what I know about the status. So the the main status is that uh, Vin from the L1 fixed uh, the contracts, so implemented all the changes that are necessary to make the contracts work again with um, our current virtual machines, so the WASM. And the issue now is that the testing for those contracts, in my opinion, is very, very complex. That means you have to set up a new testnet with um, the environment that has been there on Classic before the main upgrade, and then deploy all the old contracts of Astroport there. And once that's done, you need to do all the possible transactions like providing liquidity, withdrawing liquidity, doing swaps of different assets, native CW20, and so on. And once that is done and there's data in the contracts, you need to upgrade the testnet to the current status of the chain. And once you have done that, you need to cross-check if everything is right, if everything has been handled correctly, if the contracts work as intended, if the balances are still there, if the liquidity is still there, and um, all such stuff uh, would need to be done there's a lot of issues with this, isn't there, Strafe? There's a lot of issues surrounding the, this Astroport. And it's not... What we need to understand, what I what I just had up was the tweet from uh, Astroport themselves explaining they were sunsetting it on the 30th, uh, 30th of September 2023. So this has been an issue since around then. So it's not like anybody's picked this up. Nobody apart from the L1 has picked this up. No one's tried to pitch in. Everybody who's supposedly wanted to pitch in is not pitched in, even though they've been given the opportunity. And the only excuse I've ever seen is, oh, I'm too busy. Mm. Well, well, what you do, my thinking on that is that, to be honest, L1 shouldn't have been forced to take it on because I, at least from what I have checked, I checked all the proposals from quarter one to quarter three and none of that contained astro so in my opinion it was a mistake on their side to let them push into the position where people said they broke it they need to fix it because honestly this update from the wasm side was unavoidable and doing this update would necessarily lead to contracts being broken that use specific functions of the chain. So unless you would have um, removed the burn tax and things like that from the chain entirely, you probably wouldn't have been able to prevent that breaking of contracts. So no, that means... Awesome. Breaking of contracts yeah. is normal. It is normal with most blockchains. What normally happens is, is the entity like Astroport maintains something like that from their side. The difference is they have no need to maintain such a system because of the state of our blockchain. And that's realistically what it probably came down to um, for them. 
and it was a probably a business based decision. I'm sure it was because it's uh, it ha would have been too much effort for them to adjust all the contracts maybe even getting it reaudited because there um, are quite a few things that need to be adjusted and then deploy it again just to make it working on on classic so it's much more easy for them to say yeah uh, we sunset classic on astropod and give it to the community because that way they shift the responsibility for all the people having liquidity in um, to those people on classic that need to revitalize it it's not just as well like launching this thing even once you've got it to a point ready to launch there's still dilemmas with it even with all the, yeah. the extensive testing the build up right for those first trades will be very juicy unless somebody adjusts for that and takes that into account but something that i i really want to tread on here is how long this has been an issue so if we look at the date like i was showing at the beginning the 30th of september we look at that and we think about all of the different major supposed major players on this chain um nobody has wanted to fix this and it's not a situation and i think this is what everybody needs to understand is that it's not in anybody's best interests to fix something that specifically puts swapping on chain. The only people's best interest this has ever been in is the L1s. And Vin himself has been the person who's been behind all of it, right, Strafe, of realistically doing the majority of the work to get it to where it needs to be gotten to right now. In fact, from, from my knowledge, he did all the work on yeah. the contracts. So that's, that's what I thought as well. Yes. Um, but as you said, even launching it would be not just launching it because um, people have liquidity in it. So the slightest, slightest mistake in all the adjustments, even if it slips through review or uh, through testing, could lead to huge issues and we all know who would be responsible for that then and uh, so so my opinion as you said the next issue is the imbalance of the um, liquidity pools between things like terraport terraswap and then astropod because it was locked at a time where the exchange ratio between the tokens was uh, were totally different so from my point of view, the only thing that you could do right now is uh, to try to fix the liquidity pools to allow people to withdraw their liquidity without reopening Astroport at all. And, and, and just, well, after just before, that, decide to. Just yeah. before you go any further, just so people don't get lost with this, what we're kind of getting at here right now is, is there's not really a situation where you could launch Astroport as it is without there being a substantial risk of backlash being poured onto the person who fixed it and re-enabled it that being then now what we're saying here is is more or less there's realistically only one play you can make and what strafe is saying is just reopening it for people that are involved in it so they can get their liquidity out yes exactly then they can decide whether to wait if people decide to join the liquidity pools with other DEXs or if they decide to reopen Astroport at one point or if they want to get their liquidity out and put it somewhere else. Because from my point of view and from what I read, the most issues is that people are locked with their liquidity and oh. yeah. Hi, Vin. Um, this Hi. is amazing. So we, we, we've just been talking a little bit um, about the Astroport situation, Vin. Um, so I want to welcome you to this episode uh, on the channel. It's it's nice to actually have you back and have the main person who's been doing all of the work behind this sort of pivotal move towards Astroport getting re-enabled. What we're discussing here is the reality strafe, aren't we, of, of where, where it's kind of at and what the situation kind of is with it. Yes, uh, well, I, I guess it's just like for narrative, like 
narrative wise then that after part is totally thing that that bites our one <laughs> so um th then we were just talking about uh pretty much the in the idea of reopening it but just to those who've got liquidity in it so they can get it out and then sort of seeing what happens afterwards yes um opening liquidity yes and that's going to be the um, safer thing to do isn't it yes i i suppose so yeah, what I said was when um, that in case even if you do thorough testing on a separate test net, including all the upgrade procedures and testing all the possible interactions with Astroport by hand, even even then there is no audit anymore for the deployed contracts then because they have substantial changes, and in case anything goes wrong after it would be re-enabled, would fall back on the person who fixed it. Yes. So for you, at least from my point of view, my, my understanding, it would be a substantial risk to try to fully reopen Astroport um, without a prior full re-audit of all the changes and um, a prior option for all liquidity holders to decide what to happen uh, what about um, their own liquidity they have put in that is locked currently do we have a number yeah. of what's locked into their gems? oh i i have no number but it's it's not not only a few bucks it's uh, more than in TerraSwap, of course yeah it's if you remember correctly, then it's 700,000, almost a million. A million dollars worth of revenue? No, luck, total value luck. In oh, to oh, okay. What is that, dollar value? Yeah. yeah. So, so it's More a fair like amount. Percent. It's not. And this is, this is going to be the issue, right? Because if you do re-enable it, someone could actually get that all out through different means. If yeah. there is a bug. <laughs> oh, which we know that there is because we have all of the stable quans active. We've seen this happen before for a KRTC swap between USTC KRTC, right? Tobias patched it. Or Ed, one or the other. But there was, uh, there was Yeah, that that a... was that that was the market module, the unintended arbitrage possibility, that's true. Exactly. But um it, that's don't... Something like that, of course, can happen. And even if Vin only fixed um, the yeah, the dependencies and the libraries necessary for adopting to the changes um, that were done on Classic for the WASM, there still can be unintended side effects, at least from my opinion. So if it was me to advise, I, I really would not at this moment even try to reopen it but just allow liquidity holders to interact it's a sticky situation you know this really? whole this whole issue with um all of these sort of different major players right and the benefits of not having this system fixed working and doing all these different things is of great benefits to so many people. And what this is preventing is just decent on-chain swapping all the time. We've seen previously um, when mobile has been down or anything's been down with the swapping, we instantly see a reaction um, on the app and, in, and on the different sort of metrics that we can gauge. We see a reaction. So it's there, it's available. And um with v3 i don't know if you two have played around with the new extension but it's pretty good it's smooth it does what it's supposed to do and i think there's a lot of potential for the chain there to, to grow more and um get more of these swapping systems but if and and correct me if i'm wrong here gents but this route of re-enabling it simply to the liquidity providers allowing them and offering them an, an on uh, sorry an off ramp and out um, letting that pan out, giving everybody due notice to, 
to do what they need to do right and then maybe then making the effort to make it fully working re-enabled audited cross all the t's dot all of the i's tick all the boxes is that sort of a route that could be possibly taken with this i'm i cannot make any comments on any possible route unless fully tested but here's what i imagine is that i to do as much race as possible then perhaps just um test for sure that people cannot swap and they can only retreat they can only draw draw back liquidity yeah makes sense so that's the happy case here that's the yeah. most reliable happy case here yeah that's and I, I think what what you maybe then also need to to at some point put out there even if you took on the astroport fixing um, while it was not initially a duty of l1 fixing astroport kind of ends when the contracts were fixed and you are not a l2 deployer and astroport could have decided to let you fix it and then take it on to reaudit or deploy but from my personal opinion at this point when you fixed all the contracts is this specific thing that people demand from the l1 is uh, yeah is kind of done and if you would provide the testing and liquidity withdrawal options then that would be the i don't know cake topping or something like that but um, mm, at least it makes sense like that's the origin proposed right just fixing the code not deploying yeah. any meaningful yeah but but you have to make it clear because i think people still think uh, l1 is responsible to bring astroport back online including all the features including the interface and things like that yeah, and that, that, so you have to clarify there's such a huge confusion in the community as to the job of a validator the job of, de of developers and all of the different aspects that actually come into play now vin you're not funded unless you've been paid for a community spend proposal got so many validators that get so much in commission from the blockchain specifically after the dcm changes and the reduction of the active set you're not you're just not seeing that that return you're not seeing that inflow back you're not seeing anyone who's thinking to themselves let's fix astro report baby let's get it up and running let's get this going for the chain let's get this fixed and it's just all the time always falls on these guys always Mm. It's, um, yeah, it, it, it's like it is. It that's that's the life of a developer. If yeah. something breaks, first of all, yeah, you know who is responsible. <laughs> yeah. yeah, these are the issues. Yeah. These are the issues. Yeah, but well, but I think that would be a viable route. So if uh, Finn, with some support of whoever, can try to really test and yeah, offer a route to hang someone on, being ha Ooh, hang, yeah. on. hang on hang on yeah you you guys can both attest to this how many times have people offered to help with this but nothing how many times have you guys responded and said yeah look here's the code you know this is what we're working on get involved have you had any help Oh, I, I think Vin, no. you did all the code for the contracts. So even even Frag and myself didn't have the option at that point to help you. And these guys don't have validators. They don't run <laughs> validators. They're not getting paid anything from their nodes. So I think there's a huge issue and a huge like belay of confusion because I get last year. We were paying three months up front and I'm playing devil's advocate here, right? We were paying three months up front and we were expecting loads of different works. And at that point, yes, you could probably have put a proposal up. And I have put proposals up myself asking for the L1 to do stuff. 
I understood it then, but I don't understand it now. And it's kind of another issue we should probably talk about right now is the paid per job. There's a few comments. I could probably bring them up. I'll probably edit them in, bring them up so they show up, these different comments. And it's people now, and even, um, you know, your usual suspects saying, oh, well, um, are we doing the pay per job? We, we all approved the pay per job, but, you know, no paper. Are we going back to this old method? Or are we doing pay per job? Oh, no, you can't, you can't apply for funding now because we've approved the pay per job. And it's the same people that were saying two, three weeks ago, we don't want the pay per job. It's too centralized, this, that, and the other. I think a lot of people are saying, what happened with the paper job? I'm seeing a lot of con comments and stuff. So we should probably talk about that a little bit here as well. Um, where are we at with that, gents? What What's the issues? Mostly the issue is from my side, because like this job, it will have to be deployed on chain somehow. And um, the issues happen to be to be the R1 manager, which is me. Because uh, obviously that I, I hold the repo and I have to review it. And then I push it to the validator group. Um, so um, if this is about paper job and also reviewing, then I think I to reduce complete risk from my side, then the team proposing it should review themselves and deploy it to validator. So you mean so that you are not put at risk with, because you have reviewed and approved it? No, I will not. I'm going to review and approve, and, and such person which just have right access to classic Terra core. Mm -hmm. And such team is responsible for deploying as well. Okay, so the risk mitigation for you would only be there in, in the case that the, so, yeah, that, that the people contributing would be known. And to put it bluntly, KYC. You know, this whole system cannot work without KYC. There has to be levels of trust. Otherwise, it won't work. There's too much risk for someone like Vin, who's a manager of the repository, to merge any kind of malicious code. Yeah, so probably let's choose a different branch, like just um, like if 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 the paper job continue to go in its current form then i don't have much reviewing power actually because by then that's like gatekeeping the chain so mm -hmm. um best way forward is that i would just let every team to merge in and then let them deploy it and uh So that, but but that would mean that um, yeah. So so what you're saying would be the complete permissionless approach, right? Where validators and the community would take the risk of something breaking because um, there is no further review done by by people that could be turned to. Yes, and because like if if you look at the community right now, if you look at the chat right in in the validator Discord group, in the proposal chat, like it's just complete nonsense of community collective mind. Yeah, the the thing is, I think um, what what people might not um, be aware of. Even if you do a permissionless approach, then those people being doxxed or KYC'd like yourself cannot review it because um, that would mean they are the single point of um, contact to turn to in case they overlook something that has been slipped in. 
because everyone else um, just can uh, vanish into the into the void. So it's not I mean, like, only yeah. Um, like if, if you look at like at, at like contract work, like then there it should be a, a contract as well, like and then if if editor is unsure, then they will pay out a lump sum to a person who will review it. Yeah, but still that person would either need to take the risk or also be non-accountable. Well, I mean, like, uh, that depends on the scope. Like, if it's just for review and not responsibility, then that's how it will be. Yeah, like, well, well that is, that is exactly... Community rule. It's exactly the crossroads that I'm, I think there will be either there is some kind of responsibility or there isn't so you you cannot have the mixed part because those people um that are known won't take the risk then it's a situation where you either kind of put the fail safes in place or don't put them in, them in place and prepare to fail because someone will use that against the chain someone will prey on us doing well not us but specifically us speaking as the terra classic columbus 5 community validators across board um there's going to be bad apples and bad characters out there the chain exists because of bad actors because of a crash like it's never going to work having like a permissionless system where you can just sort of upload whatever you want and i think like you're saying straight there's going to be a crossroads where everything that is done is governance based anyway if you respect governance um but yeah it just it throws all of that out of the window when anyone can sort of merge whatever they want there's no responsibility as to who whose code it is and, and stuff like that and i think what people don't understand is this is DeFi. if someone pillages and plunders the chain there's nothing anybody can do i mean like um just look at valid uh, perspective a little bit then i think like majority of developer uh, of valid uh, of lang we just want to let the chain be let it be as stable as possible so that they can milk it as much as possible like without even the, the need for reading or having to understand the complexity of community at all. Like, that's... So, um, for Valido, like, um, I would say, like, most of them, like... Uh, what, most of them uh, don't care, then? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they, yeah they don't exa care. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is something like a lot of people, this whole sort of, oh, we should all come by R and we should all work together. And, you know, everybody sing really nice songs and dance in a circle. It doesn't work like that. There's a huge gap between people who want this chain to prosper and people who are just simply here to pillage, plunder and get whatever they can before this chain does eventually blow up on itself. Um, you just don't have what, each validator should be more or less like pushing some sort of product. There should be something they should be doing that's integrated into the chain. We just don't see that. So asking validators that, and I've said this in a recent video, right? I, I'm not going to name the validator because I'm not that kind of person. Um, But I asked them, you know, why don't you develop something? Why don't you do something? You know, you're a top 10 validator. You're getting all of this money. Why don't you do something? And they literally just laughed at me. Just, <laughs> <laughs> why would I build anything on there? And I thought they were joking, but they weren't. They were being deadly serious. Why would I do anything for that chain? And the reason for him not liking the chain is for the specific fact that it wrecked him. That it wrecked him and he's never getting any of that money back. So anything that he can claw back now is money earned back. And yeah, it's... It's a, it's, 
I always say it's a sad situation, but it's just kind of like this could all change. But I don't think the message gets across. Yeah, I see what you mean. So that they just lose much money and now they just want, want it back. So there's no reason for them to even actively engage in the chain. The chain can be however, however it is. So a lot of people sit there and they also say further, like, why do Luna, like, people, community hate this chain so much? Why is there so much friction? Why are there all of these issues? And another thing people don't understand is, is that all of these people that did get wrecked also then further got pushed onto a new chain, right? Which is Luna, the Phoenix One blockchain. If, for example, that fails and Lunk prospers and rises, that literally disproves everything. It, it throws everything into the wind of them even spinning up a new blockchain and doing all of these different things. So from my perspective, if I was in their shoes, it's in my best interest to ensure that this chain does nothing. It does nothing, it struggles, and it only pays me money what back of what I'd lost. It's, And I think this is what people don't understand is that greed really drives things, really drives things. Um, yeah, I agree. But I mean, like for that strategy right now on Lang is that every proposal that makes them look nice, it will be voted. Yes, like just they just need to look nice in the in the face of community. Yeah, you're right. And like people are like, no, nah, no, nah, it's not like that. Maybe you're new here. Maybe you don't know. Um, if you look at the USTC repeg and. You know, I'm going to I'm going to point at this for this because it's a good example. There's nothing forty thousand dollars for nothing. And all of the big validators voted yes on this. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever keeps you happy. I think they they look at everybody like a kid. A kid starts crying, whinging, whining. Oh, you know, here, have your toy. So, yeah, this this huge issue, and it's not just Luna validators. Like, if you go and look at the active set, you look at the, the Luna validators, um, it's not just them. It's so many others. Like, I, th I think the most I ever see is, like, a website. You know, people are going to produce a website. You know, we need all of these different tools. We need so many different things, and we're just not getting it. The chain doesn't have the inflow to match the outflow. Similar to what was going on with the community pool where just too much was going out all of the time. Um, and you just don't have that inflow to match the outflow. Th this chain should be at a point of net green. Hmm. Net green. Yeah, net green where the Oracle pool is actually being replenished. We've got developer yeah. funds and all of these different things. It's For me, the paid well, per really job system was always like a, a gateway to a bigger system which allows just the average joe to say i've got a project uh this is it from a to z and this is my budget that i have available and they use the system to break it down similar to what um labor markets likelihood is going to turn out to be it's always about opening up roads and avenues but it's just not that many of us doing it so um ultimately what is the the next steps with paper jobs same same with you with you vin you know what are the next steps here uh, re re refine it so remove all the uncertainties and uh, issues that occur when the things that are not well thought out that made it more complicated instead of being the most simple that it should have been or was meant to be um so that's probably what's what needs to be done because right now it seems uh, quite quite unusable for uh for many people for validator outside too much overhead for validator management way too much way too much i still like after the whole what we've just been saying here folks now you think about asking the validators base to approve code to go through and check these things meticulously and go do all the double checks triple checks and go speak to people speak to developers do all of this different no it's just not going to happen but it's a crossroads right guys 
we're going to hit this crossroads where we have to make a decision. Yeah. So at I, one point we have to. Yeah, I I personally think, folks, because of the amount of either having this system as a permissionless system where the validators and governance literally approve everything, um, it is too much risk either side of both of this to even resort to a system which opens up all of these different avenues to do scams and plunder the chain and stuff like this. I would rather just resort to the rudimentary means of asking for money up front, maybe getting paid 50% at the beginning. So just coming into the end of this and you two saying about this more simplified system, why not go for a way more simplified system where someone just, for example, says um, we've got what you guys have done, what Genuine Labs have done recently. You propose the amount of funds, right? And then it gets those funds, they get approved, the proposal is approved. Instead of all of the funds going to them, it goes to, say, a developer's wallet. And then that developer's wallet pays that out over the course of, and then that kind of being maybe a middle ground to build off of. Yeah, that, that doesn't work because it's the same as L1. Like L1 has that also in the initial, we have community oversight, which turns to L1 community oversight by community. <laughs> So, yeah, the, yeah, the issue is that work. the community cannot agree on people that are responsible for paying out funds. That's that's probably the main issue. We had so many discuss, discussions for so many um, um, yeah, occasions I, I, about uh, multi six. Yeah, I don't think it should be a person. I think it should literally just be an automated system. So ah, okay. the job specifically has a timeline. So there's eight weeks, there's a hundred uh, 100 million LUNC coins and the, the AI literally it doesn't check anything it doesn't need to do anything because it was all all approved at the beginning the difference is it gets it gets passed out in 20 percent 25 percent chunks that yeah. kind of thing so something yeah. that is literally built into the system it doesn't require a person it's not constricting it's not trying to control anything it just kind of puts a fail safe in place because yeah. eight eight weeks it's 14 weeks is still a long time. If it turns out that these guys scam and run with the first 25%, there should be a fail safe in place to prevent and get a proposal through which which eliminates that and says, no, they shouldn't continue getting the, you know, fail safes, right? But, I mean, you implement it. Yeah, make a delayed or or um, in installment payout the same as the community fund uh, uh, the community fund spent proposal is just with addition with additional parameters for allowing a delayed payment or multiple delayed payments so you can automate that uh, payout in installments and also cancel it at um, with the same method so that would remove all that. Uh, yeah, all that stuff. I think that shouldn't be that hard to do, considering that there are already block-based events, and you just would need uh, an additional storage with all uh, with all the payments and the blocks they are due. So probably you would just need a new module. I was gonna. Uh, with, I was gonna yeah. suggest just introducing a new module which pertain, which sorry, contains a. And I know this is probably going to sound a little bit off key here, but instead of messing with the community spend proposal route sort of thing, instead adding in a developer's spend proposal, which has those parameters part of it, where it has yeah, something the, like that. I think that would be probably the best route. Once again, let's not build on top of what we've got. Let's add a module because let me just keep going here and elaborating and just stay with me here, folks. If you're listening in and you're chiming in here, um, the importance of the UI, the the visual perception of what we're talking about here. It's great. We're talking about it on a developer standpoint, right? But this all boils down to how you can show this system off. And I think the importance of this system is the fact that it has the ability, right? If you get the UI right, you integrate this kind of system into station. Instead of there just being the, the one-time spend proposal where it goes up in governance, right? Instead, it gets added to active active development, 
section and there's always a thing kind of where we had the original dashboard where there's a thing there where you know this development group are working on this this development group are working on this and it's all about how the individual like myself someone who's just an everyday user at times can see these things happening i think that's where the power really comes into a system like this Mm, I see a point. I, I know I know you guys uh L1 developer yourself in and the L2s and you know visual displays and stuff like that. It's not something that's gonna be obviously easy, but I think it's definitely a route forward. Um well, I mean it can be done on layer two actually. Like choose a spare proposal and send it to a spark contract and then let the spark contract run um the payment terms yeah but but then you wouldn't be able to automate it you would need the corresponding people to withdraw it like a vesting contract of course that would be possible but the question is if it would um it wouldn't be that simple to just stop the payment via governance then it would be some some additional things to work into the contract i'm not sure if that's the best route, but it has to be discussed then if, if, um, yeah, if something like that is to be implemented for, for, for a kind of, um, delayed payment in my head, at least I always liked the idea more of having, of having something as a module right in the chain to have a separate proposal, but mm -hmm. there might be uh, reasons against that too. So yeah i've always stood by this i i definitely am the one that really seeded this uh developers spend proposal and uh, a pool yeah true uh, in yeah. the future i think there's so much power behind having a pool as well something to also show off on our statistics of our dashboard that look hey we've got this community pool which is for you community guys if you want to spin up you know a crazy project and you might need funding and you think maybe the chain will fund you this is for you and oh developers look we've got this pool which is also for you and it's not like the community pools not at a point where you couldn't start to say to yourself on the blockchain let's create a developers pool and let's put and allocate 20 percent of what goes into the community pool instead send 20 percent of that to a developers pool and start building that up because otherwise you just get the burn the the burn criminals out there just like burn it all burn it all jesus this was a good conversation between the three of us and i i really enjoyed it uh there were some good points made towards the end specifically with the paid per job alternative and possibly following that route moving forward so we'll get some more coverage out there and we'll go over a few more of these topics. But if you made it to the end, I really appreciate your support. I really appreciate you turning up to watch the content. And like I said at the beginning of the podcast, if there's anybody you want to see on the Crypto Continental podcast, let me know in the comments section below and I'll strive to reach out to them. Stay safe, stay humble, stay aware. <laughs>